So what's next for me is growing my, um, my coaching, growing my mastermind membership. Now, why am I interested in doing that? I can tell you why. Nothing else gives me more, um, makes me more happy and, and gives me more joy than making an impact in somebody else's life and being able to give back that which I've already learned. And by if you're a real estate investor and are wondering how to raise and leverage private money to make more profit on every deal, then you're in the right place. On Raising Private Money, we'll speak with new and seasoned investors to dissect their deals and extract the best tips and strategies to help you get the money, because the money comes first. Now here's your host, Jay Connor. And here's what's so cool. Once your account is funded by wherever you're moving it from, you can make unlimited money per year with no taxes. Welcome to the Freedom Point Real Estate Podcast, where we talk about creating more time freedom through passive real estate investing. Passive investing in real estate challenges conventional investment wisdom. We are passionate about learning and sharing resources with others who are ready to transform their investing mindset. Quick disclaimer as always, I am not a CPA, I am not an attorney or a financial advisor. This is not financial advice, not telling you or anyone else what to do. The views and opinions expressed in these podcasts are provided for education and informational purposes only and are not necessarily the views of my employer, ADP. I'm glad you're here. Now let's dig in. All right. Welcome back, Freedom Point Podcast listeners. Thank you again for jumping into another episode of the Freedom Point. Uh, appreciate everybody who's been you know, really listening in and tuning in lately. Uh, regularly, I'll have people reach out to me and say that they've been binging our episodes. I had one gentleman uh, that reached out and said he listened to all 60 some episodes so far uh, sitting in a, a tree stand, uh, a deer stand out in the woods. Uh, so again, thank you for those that uh, are faithful followers of our, our podcast. I have another fantastic guest with me today, a guest, by the way, that I follow on a regular basis as this guest also hosts his own podcast. So without further ado, uh, Jay Connor, thank you for joining the show. Jeremy, thank you so much for inviting me to come along. I mean, I'm so passionate about private money and talking about private money because Frankly, private money's had more of an impact on our real estate investing career than any other strategy or any other thing I've ever learned along the way. Absolutely. And again, appreciate you jumping in here with us. So I'm just going to give our listeners a real quick bio and then we can kind of fill in some holes and gaps there. Uh, Jay's been buying and selling single family homes uh, since 2003 in a town of only 40,000 people with profits now averaging approximately $78,000 per deal. Uh, Jay has rehabbed over 475 single family homes and has been involved in, get this, over $118 million in total transactions. Uh, in addition to all of this, as I mentioned before, uh, Jay is a two-time national best-selling author and a past president of Business Network International. He hosts his own podcast, um, and he and his wife, Carol Joy, reside in Moorhead City, North Carolina. Again, Jay, appreciate you being here. What else can you tell us about private money, how you're involved, how maybe people can get started, that sort of thing. Well, the way I got into private money, Jeremy, I just didn't wake up one morning and say, hey, I think I'll go raise me some private money. You know, growth takes place in the valley. Growth typically does not take place when things are going fantastic. And so, as you said there in my bio, Carol Joy and I, we started investing in single family houses back in 2003. And the first six years that we invested, Jeremy, I did all I knew to do. And that went, you know, regards getting funding for my deals. I went to the local bank. I went to an institutional lender. And for six years, I got on my hands and knees and put my hand underneath my chin. And I said, please fund my deal. Give them my tax returns, all that stuff, you know. Um, and so that's what I did for six years until... January 2009. I was sitting right here at my desk and I know it's hard to believe Jeremy, but we actually still have these things in Morgan City called handsets with cords attached to them. 
Uh, it's called a telephone. Anyway, I picked up my phone and I've been doing business with my banker. His name was Steve. I've been doing business with him for six years. He'd been funding my deals. I called him up and told him about these two houses that I had under contract that needed funding. Well, I learned very quickly that my line of credit had been shut down with no notice. And I said, Steve, what do you mean you're cutting me off? He says, Jay, don't you know there's a global financial crisis going on right now? I said, no, but now I got a global financial crisis going on with my business. No way to fund my deals. So I sat here for a moment. Now, this was a pivotal moment in my investing career. I had a choice to make. And the good news is we always have a choice. We are not victims. We're victors and we have a choice. So I could have quit and gone to the house or instead, what did I do? I sat here and I asked myself the question, who can help me with my problem? By the way, Jeremy, these people running around saying, oh, you ain't got no problems. All you got is opportunities. I want to throw up, right? I didn't have an opportunity. I had a problem. So I asked myself, <laughs> who can help me with my problem? By the way, there's a great book, Jeremy. I'm sure you're familiar with it called Who, Not How. So I immediately had a good friend come to mind. His name is Jeff Blankenship. He was investing in real estate in Greensboro, North Carolina at the time. And I called him up. I told him what had happened. He says, well, Jay, welcome to the club. I said, what club? He said, the club of losing your line of credit. I said, well, how are you funding your deals? And he says, well, have you heard of self-directed IRAs? And I said, no. He says, have you heard of private money and private lending? And I said, no. So I knew he had said something to me. So I studied what private money and private lending was. And Jeremy, I was able to attract $2,150,000 in new funding, private lending money that I didn't have before the problem came along. And you know what's interesting, Jeremy? I've yet to ask anybody for money. I've never pitched a deal. And they say, Jay, how in the world do you have eight and a half million dollars right now that you're moving from projects to projects? Well, how I do it right now, Jeremy, is exactly how I did it uh, back in 2009. So what I did is I put my private money program together as to what I was going to offer people. And you know what? The traditional way of borrowing money is you are asking for a mortgage. I'm not asking, I'm offering a mortgage, right? So what did I do? I put on my teacher hat and my teacher hat says private money teacher. And I simply started teaching people that I already had an association with. I went to church with them. We're in the Rotary Club. We're in Business Networking International together. And I started teaching people about my private lending program and how they could make high rates of return safely and securely. So I wasn't pitching any deals. You know, desperation's got a smell to it. And I've learned the worst time to be raising money is when you need it for a deal. So you can't be rejected if you're not asking anybody for anything. You're simply sharing with them this way they can make high rates of return safely and securely. And so I know how much they've got to work with. Maybe they need to be introduced to uh, the self-directed IRA company to where they can transfer tax-free and penalty-free their retirement funds to a third-party custodian and then invest those funds. And so it's just been fun making an impact in these individuals' lives that had never heard of private money. And I tell you, Jeremy, we've gotten so many thank you notes and thank yous in persons from our private lenders for us changing and transforming their retirement years. So Jay, let's talk a little bit more about what this looks like for uh, an individual investor that might choose to invest into one of your upcoming opportunities. Are they investing directly into an entity that owns multiple homes? Is it a one-to-one -one ratio? Um, kind of talk us through the difference of investing um, with you on an individual home basis. Is there a value add component to the strategy? You know, what's the exit plan look like as opposed to what most of our listeners are familiar to with, and that is investing in, in multifamily through syndication. Sure. Yeah. Um, and when you're doing multifamily, that's the way to go. You're going to have syndication. Your investors are going to invest in a fund. You're going to have your SEC attorney draw up your private placement memorandum and all that. 
Um, in my world, it's very different when it comes to single family houses. Everything we do is what's called one-offs. So what in the world is a one-off? If, if an investor is not investing in a fund, then what are they doing? Well, they are the bank. So they're not actually investing in like a stock or investing in a fund. What they're doing is they're actually, they're the bank. But it's like they're taking their money and they're putting it in a CD in the bank. It's like that, right? Except of course, the rates of return are much higher. And so they're loaning money. They're loaning money is what they're doing. They are acting in the same capacity as a bank would. So they're loaning money and they are not loaning unsecured funds. Now they could legally, but we don't do that. We don't allow our, our private lenders to loan us unsecured funds, but just a promissory note. We back all the notes and collateralize the notes with the real estate that our company is investing in. We have a very uh, conservative loan to value. So, you know, when someone's loaning money, now we got to have language and conversation about loan to value. So we have a very conservative loan to value, which means we do not allow our private lenders to loan on any deal more than 75% of the after repaired value. So we got a nice 25% equity cushion there in each property. The uh, private lender is also protected by not only the mortgage in North Carolina, it's a deed of trust, but the private lender is also named on the insurance policy. So that piece of real estate is insured and just like the bank, remember the private lender is acting just like the bank. Well, when a bank loans you money on real estate, they are named on the insurance policy as a mortgagee, another layer of protection. The same thing our private lenders, they're named on the insurance policy on that property as a mortgagee. They're also named on the title policy as an additional insured in case there's any title issues down the road. So again, we're protecting our private lenders with the same requirements that a, a commercial institutional bank would have. Yeah, absolutely. So these are really, uh, for the private lender, these are really promissory notes. Are there any um, are there any ownership interests involved here for the uh, private lender? Um, is there, you know, talk a little bit more about maybe what the, you know, value add, you know, strategy would be, you know, with this type of investment strategy. And then let's maybe talk about, are there any depreciation, passive loss depreciation benefits, you know, onto the uh, private lender uh, that chooses to get involved? Right. So the private lender does not have any ownership in the properties. Uh, again, they're like the bank. They know exactly what their rate of return is going to be. Opposed to investing in a fund or syndication, um, one thing that gives our private lenders flexibility is, again, it's like putting your money in a CD at the bank, except you get a, high, a much higher rate of return. There's a way you can get your money back early in case you have an emergency come up. So we give all of our private lenders and we put it in the promissory note. We have what's called a 90 day call option and we don't charge a penalty. You know, if you put your money in the bank in a CD, you can draw it out early, but you're going to pay a penalty. In fact, a lot of operators charge a 5% penalty if the money is withdrawn early. In my program, we don't charge any penalty. We want to make it easy for our private lenders to do business with us. So this would be an investment that would be not illiquid, meaning uh, if an investor chooses to get involved in really passive real estate investing in single family homes, uh, there would be an opportunity for that investor to pull some or all of their capital off the table. Am I hearing that correctly? That's correct. That's correct. Now what right. I discovered, I mean, it makes it nice. It's a nice exit strategy if they need to, for whatever reason. But what I've discovered since 2009 in the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these deals that we've done, uh, I've only had two notes called due early. I mean, the private lenders don't want the money back. If they get the money back, what are they going to do with it? So I've had two small notes uh, called early because of medical emergencies and bills that had come up. But we have that in the program, you know, just in case they need to get it back for whatever reason. 
do you uh, perform a cost segregation study on all of the assets in the, you know, the portfolio that you, that you manage to provide then those tax depreciation benefits back to the investors, or would there be no um, tax depreciation benefits available? There would not be any tax depreciation um, in these deals. Uh, however, if they're loaning their money out from their retirement account and they've moved it over to a self-directed IRA, there are no taxes, right? No. In fact, uh, the IRS doesn't even require my company to send out a 1099 uh, on someone that's using their retirement funds. Do you think you could do our audience uh, some justice here and in about a minute or less explain what a self-directed IRA is and why it's a good potential strategy for investors to look into if they don't have enough dry powder on the sidelines, but they want to diversify into real estate? <laughs> I never heard liquidity called dry powder. That's pretty good. So yes, <laughs> I will shoot for 60 seconds on less on what is a self-directed IRA company. It's also known as a third-party custodian. So there's a handful of companies approved by the IRS in the nation that allows you, if you've already got current retirement funds, current retirement funds, and they could be any kind of IRS designated retirement funds. They could be a, in a pension. It could be in a previous 401k and a previous employer. If you've been with the employer long enough, it could be a current 401k. You would just need to ask your plan administrator if you have the option to move out a percentage of those retirement funds, but you can move your current retirement funds over to an IRS approved self-directed IRA company, tax-free, penalty-free. And here's what's so cool. Once your account is um, funded by wherever you're moving it from, then here's the cool thing. There's no limit to the amount of money that you can earn per year. And it's either going to be tax free or tax deferred, depending on the type of account you've got. If you've got a Roth IRA that you are, you know, that you've got the self-directed IRA company, then you can make unlimited money per year with no taxes. That's pretty amazing. Yeah, it absolutely is. And uh, just to, to clarify for the listening audience here, you can't take funds from an active 401k, typically speaking, and you also can't invest directly from a 401k plan or an IRA. You first must employ a self-directed IRA custodian uh, if it's in your interest to deploy that, that strategy. So J Jay, let's talk about this for a minute. So you're operating in a town of 40,000 people. That's a fairly small town in Moorhead City, I assume. Is that correct? Yep. Moorhead City actually only has 8,000 people. Our county, the census just came out this past weekend. Our county has 69,000 people. So the 40,000 is just the target market that we're investing in. So we don't do that many deals. We do two to three deals a month that do average 78,000 per deal. And I don't share that dollar figure to brag. I share the $78,000 average profit to let our private lenders know, well, how can we pay the rates of return that we do? Well, it's because we're making big profits, right? And so how can we do two to three deals a month in this small market? Well, you got to dominate the market, clearly. And another, and another part of this story is, is um, you don't have to be in like a huge city to be making, you know, significant money on deals. There's a big advantage to be investing in a small market because, you know, Jeremy, I would much rather be a big old fish in a teeny tiny little pond than, you know, a teeny tiny fish in a huge pond. And, so, you know, I don't have that many real estate investor competitors here locally. Do other people invest in real estate around here? Of course, but I don't have the number, but, but we have all kinds of channels, marketing channels, where we have motivated seller leads coming in all the time. Facebook ads, paid Facebook ads, Google, um, you know, pay per lead, SEO. I've got the same website, for 19 years. I, my website is almost older than the internet itself, but I got the same URL, same website for all these years. So my SEO search engine optimization, I got people finding us all the time organically. We do uh, outbound calling. Uh, we do direct mail. 
And uh, we actually direct mail. We've got an eight letter direct mail system that we send out to all of people that are facing foreclosure. And we're looking to serve those people and not take advantage of anybody, help them get back on their feet and create win-win scenarios. This question is most mostly meant to be uh, a little bit on the lighter side, but have you purchased any billboards yet? <laughs> um, not for my real estate investing company. I have purchased billboards uh, for when I was flipping land and I put the billboard on the property. Um, and long ago in a previous life, I was in the manufactured housing, mobile home industry, used billboards for that, but typically, Billboards are going, I have found, are really good for directional, right? Directional versus a direct marketing response. Yeah. So you're buying 30 to 40 uh, homes per year and you're spinning, you know, out maybe 30 to 40 or maybe 50, you know, per year, depending upon what volume looks like. Um, are these typically, you know, hold periods of months? Are these hold periods of, of years? And then second to that, um, as it relates to kind of the value add element, um, are you vertically integrated and in kind of the, the management of those properties and the building construction side of those renovation efforts? What does that look like? Yeah. So first, as far as how long are these notes? So all of our notes are either two years or five years. They are two year notes. If someone's using, what did you call it? White powder uh, investment capital. Dry Dry powder, dry powder. I don't know if it's white or black, right? Dry powder. So if someone's using investment capital, two-year notes. Um, and then if they're using retirement funds, we'll just go ahead and put that on a five-year note. The market determines what we're doing with the exit strategy. Uh, and the market also determines on how we buy the property. So in this market here in North Carolina, Jeremy, we are still in a very, very hot, hot market. There's no inventory in the multiple listing service. And so all the properties that we're buying, we're buying off market directly from the owners of the properties that don't have them in the multiple listing service. So if there is a major rehab involved, uh, you know, 40,000, 50,000 or more rehab, then I'm not going to bury money in that property for the long term. We're going to flip that property. So from start to finish, due to uh, contractors being backed up and et cetera, we could easily be in a property for about nine months, right? Um, seldom is it going to be six months. So it's probably nine months to 12 months, depending on the extent of the rehab. However, if it's not a major rehab, then we may sell that home on a rent to own basis, also known as a lease purchase, where we actually help the buyers get a mortgage. They're not ready for a mortgage when they move in and we'll help them get ready for a mortgage. And then they can cash out and cash us out and our private lenders get cashed out, you know, typically within a two year period. So I am vertically uh, integrated, but not totally. So we do self-manage. We do, uh, I, I do have a project manager that oversees our projects. We'll have about six houses to seven houses in process going on all the time. We do have our own crews but we also do business with general contractors as well because the crew that I got can only be two in two houses at one time. So I do business with two other general contractors. So uh, by and large, except for the rehabbing side, we are vertically integrated and cover it all. Let's talk to that passive investor that wants to continue to crush their day job, max out their you know W2, but they also have this little itch that they want to scratch. And that is they want to get into real estate investing. They're just not sure if they want to go active or passive. This is very much a softball question for you, I'm sure. And that is what type of advice would you have for that high income earner that is considering buying a single family home to renovate themselves and maybe become a landlord versus considering partnering with somebody like Jay Connor and allowing and having you do the work? Well, it just depends on what your objective is. You know, when you invest in a, say, for example, a single family house yourself, then you're going to make a lot more profit, right? You're, you are the operator, right? You're the gal, you're the guy. Um, and I mean, 
personally, now I'm a, I'm a private lender too. I, I like to use my retirement funds to loan out, but I'm typically, I'm going to make a whole lot more money on the deal, but it depends on number one, what's your tolerance for risk? What's your tolerance for pain? Everything's got a price. My average profit of $78,000 comes with a price to pay. And what's that price? Well, his name is Murphy. I don't know if you've ever met Mr. Murphy or not, but Mr. Murphy shows up in all of my rehab projects. Mr. Murphy, by the way, is the guy who originated the saying, anything that can go wrong will go wrong. Because <laughs> when it comes to rehabbing houses, you never come in on budget. You never come in on budget. I mean, you can have the best home inspection in the world. There's always going to be Murphy, also known as oops, right? So in my formula for calculating what's the maximum that I'll pay and invest on any property, I got a line item called Murphy factor, the Murphy factor, right? So I'm, a, I'm accounting and I'm budgeting for, you know, th that extra surprise that comes along. So, you know, if, if you want to sit back as an investor or a private lender and just let the checks come in the mail, or if you just want to watch your retirement uh, balance go up, that's the way to go. Be totally passive. Now, there's a whole nother conversation about who do you decide to do business with. But let's assume you know someone such as Jeremy that's got a great reputation. He's got the integrity. He's got the experience. You know, he's got a great guy. He's got the, you know, he's honest and he knows what he's doing, right? Well, that's the way to go. You be passive. But if you like an adventure and you want to make even more money, then come over to my side of the table and, let, and let's invest in some real estate and be the operator. Yeah, that's great. And I appreciate that plug, Jay. Uh, for, for the record, listening audience, Jay and I just met. So uh, very kind words of you. And I appreciate you saying that about me. Um, I'd really like to know now, Jay, you know, what's, what's, what's next? What's Jack, what's next for Jay Connor? Any upcoming projects or goals, you know, on your, uh, in the next chapter of your real estate investing journey? Sure. You know, it's funny. You said the, the, the word of what's next or the phrase, what's next. Um, my wife, Carol Joy and I, we were out in Texas in Wichita Falls, Texas, visiting her family not long ago. And, um, one of her brothers just loves to throw out these out of the, you know, out of the left side questions out of nowhere. And so he's going around the dinner table and he's saying, what would you say is the number one thing that motivates you? And what's the number one thing that motivates you? Well, my answer was simple. What motivates me is what's next? Because <laughs> my, my Achilles heel is I get bored very, very quickly. And once I have figured out something and I got somebody else in charge to run it, then I want to go figure out what's the next thing. So what I'm spending most of my time on, in addition to the real estate investing business, is my coaching program with other real estate investors. Carol Joy and I started our coaching uh, business for other real estate investors all the way back in 2011. And we have different levels of coaching, but the group that I'm, that I'm so excited about is we now have a mastermind group of right at 40 or so individuals from all across the nation where we work together, work on deals together and et cetera. So what's next for me is growing my, um, my coaching, growing my mastermind membership now, why am I interested in doing that? I can tell you why. Nothing else gives me more, um, makes me more happy and, and gives me more joy than making an impact in somebody else's life and being able to give back that which I've already learned. And by the way, back to your question, Jeremy, what should you do if you're starting out in real estate investing and you wanna do that? For goodness sakes, don't do it by yourself. <laughs> right? Work with somebody that already knows what they're doing and, um, and learn from their mistakes and, and, and don't go through that kind of pain yourself by yourself. Yeah, I know. I appreciate that. And you're exactly right. I mean, real estate investing is 100% a, a team sport. You know, I'm a real big fan of people 
you know, that are in my own inner network, you know, connecting with other people that are doing the same thing that I'm doing, you know, certainly connecting with other sponsors, listening to other, you know, people's podcasts as well. I mean, in full disclosure, I regularly follow a dozen, you know, other podcast, you know, platforms because I'm able to learn, you know, in a very short period of time, a lot of information out there really largely for free, right? You just have to be willing to go, you know, uh, know where to look for it, number one, and number two, spend time, you know, pursuing it. Um, so let, along the ed education line, what would be one or maybe two different book recommendations that you'd recommend to that, you know, investor that's uh, looking to diversify, you know, out of Wall Street and into to Main Street, so to speak? Well, Generally speaking, so I'm not thinking of a specific real estate investing book other than my own, where to get the money now. <laughs> so, so self plug right there. But um, just, I mean, and I'm an avid reader. I love reading, not for the sake of reading. I love reading for the sake of personal growth. The book, um, the book, Jeremy, that had the biggest impact on me when my life was a total mess a hot mess, a wreck, was uh, written by Og Mandino. And the name of the book is University of Success. And it just really fixed my mindset. You know, I tell new real estate investors, you're really not going to have an easy time being successful at real estate investing until you own the real estate that is between your ears. So University of Success really fixed my mindset and my outlook. Another book that comes to mind, and I was so uh, honored to have the author on my podcast, Raising Private Money, was uh, Bob Berg, uh, co-author of The Go-Giver. I'm sure you're familiar with that book, Jeremy. And uh, I, did, I never heard of The Go-Giver until probably about six or seven years ago. And uh, what a wonderful book when it comes to this world of service. And you know, Jeremy, another thought just comes to mind that I would give out from my own personal experience as advice. And that is don't ever get involved in a money-making opportunity unless your only interest and your only passion is to make the dollar. I'm talking now, I'm not talking directly about being a passive investor. I'm talking about getting involved in a venture and like working something or working a project. And I tell you, the reason I say that is, and thank goodness I learned this years ago when I was younger, but every time I got involved in a project or an opportunity and my only interest whatsoever was the almighty dollar, I failed miserably. I never wow. launched. I never even got off the ground with it. So that being said, don't lead with money being your motivation. Yeah, lead absolutely. with lead with service, lead with having a servant's heart, making a difference. And as long as the business plan is sound, it's going to come back to you tenfold. Yeah, I've seen that in my own personal life as well. And uh, those are a couple of great book recommendations. We'll put them in the, uh, in the show notes of the podcast episode here. Um, outside of maybe a couple of the different ways that, um, you know, you've mentioned uh, that our audience can connect with you, you know, what would be maybe kind of the main, main different ways we can uh, learn more about what Jay's got, got going on? Sure. Well, I'd love to give my book away if that's all right, Jeremy. And of course. my book is called Where to Get the Money Now. So if you are looking to raise private money yourself on the other side of the coin, this walks through step by step as to how I do it without ever asking anybody for money. And you can pick up my, it's 20 bucks at Amazon where you can get it for free, just cover shipping. Um, by the way, the postal service is still in business. So we actually mail this priority mail, three day delivery. You can pick up my book at J Connor, by the way, I'm an ER, not an OR, J Connor, J-A-Y-C-O-N-N-E-R.com forward slash book, J Connor.com forward slash book. I'll autograph it and we'll ship it to you three-day priority mail. You can also follow me on my podcast, which is called Raising Private Money with Jay Connor. And in addition to that, Jeremy, I got a $3,000 value gift for your listeners. I put on a live event in person, not virtual, three times a year. It's called the uh, Private Money Academy Conference right here in Eastern North Carolina on the coast at the beach. 
and uh, three times a year. It's a $3,000 ticket uh, to come to the event, but your audience can come for a $97 registration fee at www.jaysliveevent.com, all spelled out, J-A-Y-S-L-I-V-E-E-V-E-N-T.com. Go check out that URL. It'll tell you all about the live event. Great. Well, thank you for that uh, gift for my audience. And um, also, uh, the book recommendation, Where to Get the Money Now. I'll definitely be uh, acquiring that uh, book here in the next 24 hours, so appreciate that. Um, and also appreciate you just being here with us uh, on the Freedom Point podcast show. Jeremy, thank you so much for having me. What an honor. Thank you so much. God bless you and all the listeners. Yeah, thank you, Jay. And listening audience, thank you again for joining us on another episode of the Freedom Point. We look forward to having you join us on the next episode. Thank you for hanging out with us today and for listening to the Freedom Point podcast powered by Starting Point Capital. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Nothing said on this show should be considered financial advice. Before making any financial decision, please consult with a professional. This show is copyrighted by the Freedom Point podcast. Written permissions must be granted before syndication or rebroadcasting. If you're interested in connecting, you can find contact information at startingpointcapital.com. Are you feeling inspired by the knowledge you gained in this episode? Then head over to jconner.com slash money guide. That's j-c-o-n-n-e-r.com slash money guide and download your free guide that shares seven reasons why private money will skyrocket your real estate investing business right now. Again, that's jconner.com slash money guide to get your free guide. We'll see you next time on Raising Private Money with Jay Connor.